sorry, Mum. Do you know about the orgasm gap? <laughs> no, no. I'm just, I'm, I don't even know why I'm here. Love plugger. Love plugger. Love a bullet. You know? Yeah. Dang. Cheers. Cheers. Welcome to episode five. We are back with Bunnies and Bondage and everything in between. And today I am joined by the incredible Emma Louise Boynton. And we are talking about the orgasm gap. Oh, my favorite topic. This oh. is a conversation that needs to be had, right? 100%. I mean, it's kind of the reason, not kind of, it's totally the reason I set up my company, Sex Talks. Um, so I said, my name is Emma Louise Boynton. I run, I'm a presenter, writer, and I run uh, the platform Sex Talks, which exists to engender more honest and open conversations around typically taboo topics, including sex, relationships, the future of intimacy. Obviously, what we talk about all the time is the orgasm gap. So let's get into it. Okay, Emma, this is our quick fire round. Excellent. I've got a few questions. These are good questions. You ready? Yep, I'm ready. It's like okay. game show version. Yeah. I love this. <laughs> okay. Do you think people shy away from having the conversation about the orgasm gap? Yes, but I think a lot of people actually don't know about the orgasm gap, so they don't even know to talk about it. Interesting. Okay, do you think it's important to discover how you orgasm alone before you do it as a couple? Yes. Quick fire. Simple as that. Yeah, it is. <laughs> okay, toys or no toys to help stimulation during foreplay? Oh, toys. Yeah. Always. <laughs> <laughs> we love that. Um, oh, have you ever had to fake an orgasm? I think that I'd ha I've probably had to, but I haven't. Probably would have made things a little bit simpler, but I'm just, no. Me too. <laughs> um, do you still think there's a stigma against women who love sex? Yes. We'll get into that. Um, oh, this one's interesting. Do you think porn has had a positive or negative impact on people's sex lives? I don't think that we can say either way because porn is so like, multifarious. There's a tendency to talk about porn as if it is this one kind of monolith. And actually there's so many different types of porn. Yeah. Some porn I think has been very damaging. Some porn I think is amazing and can really help people discover their sexuality, learn about their sex drive, etc. So I think a not very rapid fire answer, <laughs> which we can go into later. I feel like you've come to the right place and Summers, Bunnies and Bondage, but we want to know a little bit more about you. Can you tell us about your background? How did you get into sex talks? It's a great question and a pretty uh, <laughs> unlikely journey, I suppose. So I used to work in news and current affairs. So I worked, okay. <laughs> obviously, <laughs> obviously. Um, so I used, I mean, I did a master's work for a think tank, then went into news. So I was working between BBC and Sky News on their political programming as a producer. Okay, wow. And then moved over to New York and worked as a producer for Tina Brown on her live journalism event, Women in the World Summit. Amazing. And this is important background because it kind of, the journal, it sharpened my kind of journalistic yeah. teeth across BBC, Sky, Tina Brown. And then with Tina, I really learned how to do a really great live event. And what I think I loved about Women in the World is that Tina really translates proper, good, investigative journalism into a show. And I've never seen an event done like that elsewhere. So I really felt like I'd learned from the best. Um, I then came back to the UK kind of mid twenties and I was just hell bent on running my own companies. I was like, I, well, I can do this on my own. <laughs> I can do this. I want to be independent. Um, and set up my first company, which is a political issues platform, which was a very noble endeavor with a terrible business plan. So we just skate past that one. <laughs> um, learned lots. Then I set up a um, live events business called Her Hustle, which was the kind of through way of like my career is, I love talking about anything that's kind of a bit taboo or that people just aren't really talking about. Got a little bit, um, uh, pushed back by the pandemic. I mean, oh, it's no. tricky launching a live event because we raise money. Uh, everything was going amazing. No the pandemic hit two weeks no. later after I went full time. So it was unfortunate, but from the ashes yeah. came sex talks. <laughs> so that's the a Phoenix. kind of like context to kind of, I guess, where my like, my love and my joy of journalism and writing and presenting has come from. But it was actually during the pandemic, I was running Her Hustle, feeling a little bit beleaguered by this, um, that I was at a dinner party with uh, a group of kind of semi-strangers actually. And we were talking about sex. 
And I was like, Honestly, quite unusual for a dinner party, would you say? Mm, Not the yeah, dinner parties you, you know, go to. Well, you know what though? Actually, prior to setting up sex schools, I didn't talk about sex that much because I didn't really like sex. I wasn't particularly sexual. And I said to the girls at the table, I was like, yeah, I actually haven't been able to um, orgasm and partner sex for years, ever since I'd broken up with my like one like love long-term boyfriend at like 24. I just stopped being able to orgasm and partner really? sex. But I was like, I just don't, I'm not sexual. I don't really care. Like it's just, I've got a lot of anxiety around sex. And two of the women at that table, not one, two, had both seen the same sex therapist and had since become evangelicals for the cause of sex therapy. And turned to me, one of them was like, Emma, <laughs> you know you can fix this. Like this is a really rectifiable issue. And it's also really commonplace to have issues around orgasm and kind of sex generally. She was like, you go and see the sex therapist. And I was like, well, what do I have to lose? We were kind of in that phase where we were like in and out of lockdowns. Um, so obviously we've been out at that period during the pan, um, dinner party. Then we went back into one. I was like, you know what? Whatever, I've got the time. <laughs> so started doing sex therapy on uh, online with this amazing sex therapist based in uh, Australia. And no I was way. working, I know, quite sure. It would be weird <laughs> time in the difference. evening. Yeah, so I'd be like, and I remember we actually started at like the Christmas holidays, I think. So I'd I was back home with my parents. So I was like crouched over my laptop in like the spare room, in my parents' house. They're like watching TV next door, and I'm like, I she's like, oh, we're gonna have <laughs> She's like, so we're gonna go through your sexual history, and I was like, oh, I first had penetrative sex. I'm <laughs> uh, with my parents, know literally everything. So, um, but yeah, so I start, and I at the time, alongside doing her hustle, I was kind of desperate for kind of community and and work with other people. So I'd I'd um started with The Stack, which is run by Sharmdeen Reed as a kind of founding editor, helping set up the kind of editorial platform. And Sharmdeen Reed being the like massive brain that she is, was like, you should write this as a column. Uh, it can be called Conversations with My Sex Therapist. And you just kind of write up your experience of doing therapy. So started writing this column. And it was really interesting because it, one, it incentivized me to continue doing the therapy. And I'm mm. pretty like instant gratification. I want results yeah. right now, which is not what therapy is about. But I was also really surprised. In doing sex therapy, I, obviously unpacked a lot and realized, I think I'd had an eating disorder from age 12. I'd been really anorexic, then I was bulimic. And I think probably hadn't acknowledged the extent to which the eating disorder was still so much part of my life. It was very much my coping mechanism for stress and anxiety. And it really come to the fore again in the pandemic, as I know anyone with mental yeah. health issues, uh, it's quite a kind of common thing to happen then. And it was kind of piecing together in the therapy room that for as long as you have, as long as you kind of are waging a war against your body as I had been for as long as I could remember. It's really hard to feel, to be able to enjoy pleasure and to give yourself the permission to feel pleasure, to ex to explore and indulge in sexual pleasure. Mm -hmm. And my sex therapist like really allowed me to see that. And so I wrote about this in, in, in the column and I was inundated with women saying, I've had the same thing. I've had eating disorder, can't, haven't been able to orgasm and partner no sex, way. all the stuff. And I was like, this is wild. Up until that point, I had not felt this a conversation I could have with anyone. I felt it was like my dirty secret, my like point of shame, eating disorder, not being able to orgasm, having issues with sex. And suddenly I was like, whoa. So there are a lot of people who are going through something like similar and are also feeling broken and, and like shame about that. What? And it was really that that was kind of the catalyst for me thinking, okay, well, this surely there's a way of translating the kind of conversations and insights I'd had in the mm. therapy room in some more kind of like public way. Because I didn't know sex therapy existed. Most people don't know sex therapy exists. Yeah, or you assume it's for couples. Like, oh my gosh, every single friend of mine was like, Emma, why are you doing sex therapy? You are single and yeah. you're having sex. <laughs> and I was like, that is not the point. I was like, thank you for Hang pointing that out because I totally <laughs> forgot. I'm like, crazy me. But your relationship to sex, first and foremost, is about your relationship to yourself. If it was about my relationship to my body, how was I going to let someone else enjoy my body? Mm. And also, how was I going to allow someone else to help me enjoy my body if I hated my body so much yeah. that I was punishing it so cruelly every single day. And so I think once I'd had all these um, women message me, I was like, no, this ha this is mad, this has, to, this has to stop. So set up what was the kind of first live event, Sex Talks. Um, so I'd always run events before, as I said, but did one on the orgasm gap, very appropriate for today. Yes. Thinking, does anyone else want to talk about this? Yes. Is this something that anyone else is interested in? And it turns out it was. It's been a sellout event series since launch and it's just snowballed into lots of other things. Okay, let's talk about the topic that we're here to talk about, the orgasm gap. 
What is the orgasm gap? I thought you'd never ask. <laughs> um, the orgasm gap is the disparity between the rate at which men versus women orgasm during heteronormative partnered sex. So all genders typically orgasm 95% of the time when they're masturbating. Okay. So pretty much when you masturbate, whatever your gender, you're orgasming pretty consistently. Now that drops to 65% for women when they're having heteronormative partnered sex. Okay. It says 65%. And then drops even further to 18% in the context of casual sex. So if you're having sex with a partner, it's about, you're orgasming about 65% of the time. In when you're having sex. like regular sex with that same partner. Exactly. Casual sex, 18%. And <gasps> I honestly think- Just for women, 18%. Just for women. So, and I think that statistic might even be a bit fluffed. Well, uh, I mean, I mean. <laughs> not, not talking personally, but uh, you know. Um, meanwhile, men orgasm 95% of the time, pretty consistently. So whether they're masturbating or having sex with a woman, they're, they're orgasming 95% of the time. Okay. So that orgasm gap isn't there. And what is interesting to note here is that I think when we, when we, Whenever I've like to mention the orgasm gap at events or anecdotally to friends, so often I met the same response, regardless of whether I'm speaking to a man, woman, anyone, is, yeah, but the thing is, women's bodies are just more complicated. It's just, it's just it's harder, harder. Harder to make a woman come. It's not. What that then suggests is that it's an anatomical issue. So it suggests that the orgasm gap is because of our physiology. But it's something to do with the female anatomy that just makes it harder to orgasm. Now that we know that's not the case because there is no orgasm gap when it comes to same sex couples. So for really? two women having sex with one another, there is no orgasm gap. And it's also a 95% hit when you masturbate. You masturbate. Exactly, exactly. And so what then I've interviewed this brilliant um, sex therapist, Dr. Karen Gurney, who has a book called Mind the Gap, which I recommend everyone to read. Love that title. Uh, which really deep dives into the orgasm gap and the the social, cultural context in which the orgasm gap occurs. And because it's a cultural, and she basically points out that rather than it be an anatomical issue, it's a cultural issue. And thus it's one we can address. Because really it comes down to how we've learned about sex and kind of I guess really how we, well, what we haven't learned about sex and how really like lacking sex education is. Because I think we've really been taught what little sex education I know I've personally had and people who come to sex talks and tell, tell me like anecdotally is that sex uh, education really is two things. Don't get pregnant and don't get an STI. Yes. And whatever little um, insight you get into what sex can and should be, it's very heteronormative. There's often a real primacy placed on male pleasure. It's all about sex is about male mm. ejaculation. So the goal of sex is about a man coming. And that is a message that is reinforced across the board. You think of every film you've watched growing up, TV shows, a lot of mainstream porn. Yeah. The focus has been on the man's pleasure. Mm. And so I know, you know, growing up, that's really what I thought sex was. It, it's, I am there to help make a man come. And that is kind of my role in a sexual dynamic. <sighs> is it little wonder that we then have an orgasm gap? I think as a woman, you don't really know Growing up, I felt it's like how to advocate for your pleasure, to advocate for what you want. And I think equally for men as well, they've also grown up in a culture that has put a privacy on male pleasure and has said that sex is typically penis and vagina sex. Yeah. So they also don't know like to ask women like, what do you want? What do you like? Yeah. Knowing that like oral sex often is like really key for most, like clitoral stimulation is really key for most women to orgasm, not just penis and vagina. So I think we've all really been done a massive disservice in how we've been brought up understanding sex and what it kind of can and should look like. And as I said, I just think it's little wonder we have an orgasm gap. I totally agree. So where do you think that we need to start? Because there's so many different elements to it, right? There's the whole, you might not know what works for you and what you want. Then there's the whole, oh my God, how do I have the conversation with my partner to say this is what I do and don't want? How do I tell them that whilst we're having sex? What's he think? There's just so, so much. much. So where do we start? It's a great question. And I think you've actually uh, articulated, I think a few really kind of important things here. So first of all, I think, Part of the problem with the orgasm gap is that most people don't know that there is an orgasm gap. So how do we fix a problem we don't know mm. exists? And so anecdotally, I run a series called Sex Talks, as I said, 
It's a pretty self-selecting audience of people who have booked tickets to come to a talk about sex. And I ask the audience quite frequently, who here knows what the orgasm gap is? I get a few hands going up and I'm like, really? And I mean, that to me is so indicative of the fact that just, it, it's not like common parlance. A lot of people just don't know it exists. So I think first and foremost, we need to get talking about the orgasm gap. So yeah. I always say, I always have set people around me, I've set a challenge. Tell five people in your network friends, family, whoever, about the <laughs> orgasm gap and by get the way, them. Yeah, by the way. Trivia. We, we yeah. need to talk about the orgasm gap during a table conversation. <laughs> hey, mum, do you know about the orgasm gap? And, but but do and, and, and make it kind of normalise talking about it as a in the way that you talk about other issues which to do with gender inequality. I mean, I don't know how many people are sitting around their dinner table talking about gender inequality issues. Yeah. I certainly am. So I'm obviously a massive nerd there. But imagine if you tell five people and they tell each tell five people, you can see how that kind of spider's web of knowledge grows. So I think first and foremost, we need to normalize talking about the orgasm gap and get people aware that it exists. Because I also think, you know, I, I don't think it's like men being like, I don't want to give women pleasure. No, I think, often, I think it's the opposite. Yeah, I think I mean, they don't know. I think all of us have uh, too little knowledge and information about sex growing up. And I think, as I said, it it, it damages all of our relationship to sex, and our experience yeah. of sex. So I think first and foremost, we need to talk about it more often, get wised up, read books like Dr. Karen Gani's brilliant book, really understand what the orgasm gap is. Secondly, and you pointed this out uh, earlier, I do think it's really important as a woman to get to know your own body. So I think before I did uh, sex therapy, I obviously didn't have a very good relationship to sex. I didn't really masturbate much. And I definitely, I had no idea what to tell a sexual partner uh, what I liked. And I remember once actually someone asking me, um, it's a pretty thick guy, how is that? And he was like, turned to me, he was like, you know, what do you like? What do you want me to do to you? And I was like, good guy. Yeah, great guy. And I was like, um, I had no idea. No and it was so confronting. And first was the first time someone had asked me. And I think I was like 26. So I wasn't like, I've been having sex for a couple of years by then. But second of all, I was like, I actually don't know. And it took years before it took doing sex therapy a few years later to realize like the onus is on me yeah. to know what I want because you can't just expect every sexual partner to just magically find, no. be able to press that button. And especially if the gap's so big with casual relationships, if you don't know someone that well, totally. they're not a psychic. So you're gonna have to communicate it in some way. Exactly. Right? And I think we have to appreciate everybody is different. Yeah. So what everyone likes is gonna be different. So I think every time you go into a sexual experience, don't just try and kind of repurpose what you've yeah. done before, but take it as a new body. What do you like? What feels mm. good? What doesn't feel good? Um, but I think particularly for women, really important to masturbate, to self-pleasure, because I think that helps you understand like what feels good, what doesn't, and just to get a little bit more connected to your body. I love that because obviously, Anne Summers, we are so big on self-care, self-love, yes. self-compassion. And this is an excuse to get to know your body, right? This yeah. is a this is a great excuse for that. It's not an excuse, it is a duty. We said it is a duty, we are duty, duty bound. Exactly, but I, I actually see it now as like quite a meditative practice. I don't like meditating, I'm not very good at it. I get distracted. But I do find masturbating is a really meditative practice because you're really forced to really connect the body so I was like mm. close my eyes I don't watch anything I do use toys and I love actually we have can I pick this can I show Hi, this you oh just yeah. say do what you want with it but <laughs> well bye bye <laughs> do whatever this you want is such a good sex <laughs> this takes you to places that oh my god I've we call this before. the microphone yes yeah, not actually called the microphone it's called the wand but it's the multi-purpose <laughs> microphone um no the anthemus wand is such a good sex toy genuinely i am not being paid to say that i think it is one of the best sex toys i've used it's an um, amazing place to start if you are exactly and if you are scared because the the word that sort of came to mind i mean not for me personally but i think it would for a lot of people with masturbation is that element of shame Totally. And I think that's why for a lot of people, they either don't do it or don't talk about it. They're then not connected with their own body. They then go into the bedroom with someone else and it's like you roadblocks. Put, totally. And you, I think you point out such uh, another kind of key uh, thing that we have to break down in order to address the orgasm gap is a shame that I think is so universal when it comes to sex. Yeah. I think things are changing and that's really exciting now. But I think definitely when I was growing up, Men wanking was just like, 
every oh guys wank that yeah, was just yeah, thing. yeah girls masturbating oh not god so it to wasn't be. totally to be yeah. it wasn't until i went to university i remember um passing ann summers with my friend yes and be, and she was like oh my god i love my like bullet whatever it was and i was like what's a bullet i had no idea i'd never used a sex toy and she was like hold up <laughs> you don't masturbate and i was like ah uh, like I mean, I, the shower was once, like, pretty fun. <laughs> and she ended up buying me a bullet. And what a friend. Oh, what a friend. <laughs> that was a game changer. But it does change your life because it literally unlocks this world it to, like, un- self-discovery. I often think when I have to pay, like, orgasm, I'm like, I cannot believe this is free. <laughs> this is free. I am getting this for free. <laughs> and I think, but I do think it's a really important part for, for getting to know your body better, but also like connecting your body. And I also always am quite aware when I'm super stressed and I feel like just quite disconnected from my body, I'm living in my head, not my body. I can really tell in the quality of my orgasms. They're really like dulled down. And I always find it's quite a useful litmus mm. test for how kind of out of body I've become. I totally agree with that because I think on the surface you think sex is a physical thing but so maybe it's 50 50 or maybe it's even more so like it's an inter- it's to do with your mindset right totally and that's why so sexual dysfunction um which i guess also we should we should draw on when it comes to orgasm gap the sexual dysfunction where you have some sort of barrier to being able to, to orgasm for me i had situational anorgasmia which is really common i think it affects more than 50 percent of women at some point in their lives and it's basically where there are certain situations in which you're not able to orgasm so for me it was in partnered sex and often actually in masturbation as well i was very found it really really hard to orgasm most of the time, not all the time, most of the time that is psychosomatic. So it's a psychological issue. It's nothing anatomical. There's no like, nothing is broken on your body. Mm. It is your mental relationship to sex. And that can be often, and as it was for me, it can be to do with anxiety. So you have a sexual experience once and you don't orgasm for whatever reason. And then the next time you're having sex again, you remember you're like, oh God, I hope this doesn't happen yeah. again. And like plants. Exactly, seed, I hope it doesn't yeah. happen again. I know this, I think it's all the same for erectile dysfunction yeah. uh, when men talk about their experience with that. And it becomes a kind of self-filling prophecy because again, anything that when you're having sex puts you in your head and so takes you out of your body. So it, chief amongst that anxiety mm. is a pretty surefire way to ensure you don't have an orgasm because you again you're disconnected from your body so actually what and that's why masturbation again is so important because it's like helping to train your mind and body to stay connected and so you're actually really tapping in and, you, and as i said it's mentorship you're thinking okay you're tapping into your body how do i feel what feels good or does that does that feel good there yeah. am i like it's trying that? to be present so that your mind's totally. not over here so that you can actually exactly. enjoy it Now, we have had some incredible questions sent in by our amazing Fan Summers community. I think we should start. I'm going to ask one to you. Okay, fabulous. I've got some one for you as well. These are great. These are really, really good. Yeah, they're really good. good. Um, I want to take this opportunity as well to say thank you to you guys, because your questions are always amazing every episode. So let's get into it. So Charlie, shout out to Charlie, says, how would you approach any issues regarding orgasms with a partner? Question mark, exclamation mark. Love the exclamation mark. (laughs) I mean, I think, first of all, a conversation helps. Mm -hmm. And I think what is really helpful is to, rather than starting up that conversation when you're in the bedroom in that moment of vulnerability when you're having sex be like by the way what you do isn't good and they're like going down on you (laughs) it's a bit of an awkward um and also like quite instead try and have that conversation outside of the context of having sex so uh if and you know if if you're if it's a long-term partner i think that's a bit easier but i think try and bring it up so that you can then be like oh and in a way that's not um being like critical so i think rather than being like i really don't like the way you finger me it doesn't help (laughs) and I don't get an orgasm it's from it. It's a no. It's a no from me, guys. <laughs> Instead, approach it like, oh, by the way, I've been thinking a lot about, oh, maybe I was listening to podcasts the other day and they were talking about the orgasm gap. They were talking about something to do with sex and it got me thinking, I would love to try this or yeah. I'd love to try that. Yeah. I really love it when you do yeah. X and I wonder if we could do more of it. So you're really like speaking positively. Um, and I know personally, I've, I've had partners before was one partner in particular who only told me the things that I was like doing wrong that he didn't like. So no, that doesn't feel good. That doesn't work. And I just what really, do you want? <laughs> yeah, it really knocked my confidence because I was like, God, and I yeah. try new things, and so and he'd be like, ah, oh, just it doesn't feel anything, but didn't give me any indication as to what would feel good. And it's really hard to then you you, you do feel your confidence uh, dented in those situations. So I think try and have the conversation outside of of the bedroom and try and speak really positively about the things you're excited to explore, mm. excited to try what they're already doing right and what. 
you'd like more of. And just, I think just like have fun with it as well when it does come to actually doing it. Yes, sex is play. Right. It's like grown up play and it doesn't need, like it ain't that deep. Yeah. Let's, let's not make it a kind of too serious and kind of formal conversation. Like it is fun. It's about pleasure and enjoyment. Yeah. So should I do one for you? Yeah. Right. So this question is from Sandy Candy. Hi, Sandy. Why do you think women feel a need to fake orgasms? I think it could be two things. Mm -hmm. One, they don't want to dent the guy's pride or ego. Yeah, it's happened. Yeah. Well Woo! done you, sort of thing. Um, or, and I've heard some of my friends talk about this. They're like, I'm, I'm done, it was great. And I don't want to say, okay, it's good, we're done. So they, they fake it mm. as like an exit strategy, kind yeah. of. Yeah, I have actually done that once. <laughs> <laughs> you did ask my mum faked it. Uh, there was one time and it was for that reason, exactly. I was just like, I'm done here. Like, yeah. totally. And also obviously, and this is the orgasm gap, not, f not being able to communicate and say, yeah. okay, it's not happening, babes, or yeah. this is what we need to do. And I think it comes back to what we were talking about before with regards to shame. I think mm. it's that like shame if you want it to finish and it hasn't finished or shame that, you know, for me, I couldn't orgasm for years in partner sex and I felt like I was broken and it was something that was wrong with my body and I didn't yeah. want the, my whoever I was sleeping with to know. I mean, not that I faked orgasm, but I can really see how women would in that situation because you feel like somehow there's something wrong with you. You're bad, you're broken, all these things. And so I can see why people then fake it to try and cover that up. Yeah. But no, I'm normal, my like body works. Yeah. And actually, you're not gonna orgasm all the time. Like it's not gonna happen all the time. Someone said this to me once, it's your public service duty <laughs> for the next woman who comes along to call out stuff if it's not that great. And I, I think love it is. That. Even if you don't do it for you, do it for the next woman. It's your duty. Um, Lucy Lou says, have you ever had to deal with, I love that deal with, a partner reaching an orgasm first and has been too selfish to carry on and allow you to climax? Like <laughs> most of my sexual history. Yes, 100%. And how do like, you deal with that yeah, person? Yeah, you know, yeah, it usually happens now too often than I'd like to say. And it's hard because I think sometimes you do reach that point, you're like, you know what, I am tired. Yeah. I got work tomorrow morning. I gotta work <laughs> out. And you're like, let's be done here. But I do think it is about saying like, and it's, it's hard because it is, you have to have the confidence to advocate for your own pleasure mm. and to say, hey, can I, can you now do this to me? Which I- Or do me first. Exactly. <laughs> I've really struggled with that. I think it is hard. And yeah. I think it comes back to that practice. Mm. of just like forcing yourself to do it and just getting more comfortable with saying, okay, now now can we do this? Or now can we try this? Yeah. Um, because I do think, again, it's that shame thing. I'll often be like, oh no, just like, it does my needs like don't matter. Like this has been about them. And I, and I, you know, I talk about stuff all the time, talk about the orgasm gap and I still do that. So I think it is like the most normal thing to, to do, but you have to try and break that. That cycle mm. and also I think like if you dive straight into sex like sex sex penetrative sex it's harder for girls to orgasm that way right so yes. this guy's gonna be like woohoo exactly. so it's like encouraging let's do other bits so foreplay before. shouldn't be called foreplay because it suggests it's like I don't like optional... that word by the way I no. think it's a bit gross well it's kind of like foreplay. it's an optional starter sounds very like sex education and yeah. now we are talking about Ugh, totally it sounds kind of clinical <laughs> and as if, yeah, as if it's kind of an optional thing that's like an, an added bonus and as you just uh, rightly pointed out the majority of women I can't remember the exact stat but the majority of women need clitoral stimulation in order to orgasm so penetration alone is not going to make most women come so for a lot of women like you know having oral sex or being fingered or whatever it be that is sex because that's the thing that's yeah. making you come so I don't think we should think of these things as like optional extras but actually they are they're part of the main meal exactly or if it hasn't happened Exactly, get the vibrator out. Just get the toys out. Yeah, exactly. Right, I've got another one for you. So this is from Getting Sexy in the Sun. I love that you, though. That's gonna be me this summer, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think men are offended when women need to use toys for an orgasm? Oh, that's a very good question. Um, I think some, yes. Um, some of my friends are, they've been in a relationship for a while. 
And they're like, okay, I've been watching the podcast for loving all the toys. How do I introduce them into my relationship without making my partner feel threatened? Because I think that there might be that thing where it's like, am I not enough? Like, can yeah. I not do it? So I think it's, again, like a communication thing and it being like, okay, would you feel comfortable with this or shall we yeah. try this or just maybe just bringing in a bullet or something yeah. like kind of, love a bullet. you know, mm-hmm. yeah, something that's not so threatening. <laughs> I, think, I, think that, I think the one's okay and though. The microphone. Yeah. And the microphone's great. Yeah, I think that you're right. And I think that we have to, I think we really have, all of us need to try and like remove our ego from the bedroom because it's just, it is, it's kind of pointless and it's going to be a barrier to pleasure. Yeah. It's like whatever is going to work in that situation to help elevate you and your partner's pleasure is only a good thing. Yeah. Don't take it as like any sort of point of pride. But I think you're right, having that conversation around it and being like, by the way, I personally really love using sex toys during sex. Like, can we incorporate it? Yeah. So you introduce it from the beginning. Yeah. And so it doesn't feel like kind of a surprise at the end of being like, oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, this wasn't actually good enough. Okay. So I now need. So I think that I can understand maybe then in that moment someone feels like, oh, sh- you know, I was. I didn't, I didn't do enough. And actually, yeah. like, by the way, just to set the context, I often really like bringing sex toys. So I just want to say like, yeah. can, we, can, we, can we make sure that we do that? Yeah. So you're kind of setting the context. Exactly that. And maybe if you haven't used any toys before with a partner, the couples, there's like specific couples toys that are like, this is for both of us. Yes, exactly. Bring them in. Yes, love that. Love it. Um, Sandy Candy, hey babe, says, what would be the products you advise to start, to use to start discovering your own body? I mean, how many times can we hold up <laughs> um, the one? Well, I do think, as I said, clitoral stimulation is uh, key for most women being able to orgasm. So I think beginning with a simple vibrator sex toy that allows you to explore and experience the joys of clitoral stimulation uh, is a great way to begin. Mm. And I found, and I actually still find it now, I don't find anything that's like penetrative that is not, doesn't really work for me when I'm masturbating. I find it a bit yeah, too invasive. Yeah, yeah. So I think for me personally, having uh, something like the one that you can just use to stimulate your clitoris is a really good way to begin getting used to giving yourself yes. orgasms. And then you can progress and then you can, and then you can see, do I like a dildo? Do I like a butt plug? Do I like anything else? But I think that's pretty, pretty good like starting point. Yeah. And I think also not to like plug stores and all of our, all of our products and our services. However. Plug them. If, plug, but plug them. Plug, plug them. I would say if you're, if you're online on the website and you're like, I don't even know where to start. Go into store and speak to yes, the our apple. experts on what do I start with? And they will literally be able to guide you. Yeah. Also, I think that really helps to break down the shame because yeah. I think it's, I, I mean, we all remember our, like first few experiences going into Ann Summers and being like, oh, yeah. yeah. They're like, when you go to the back of the yeah. store and you're like, ah. yeah. and they're like, uh, sorry, can I help you? And you're like, no, <laughs> no. I'm just, I'm, I don't even know why I'm here. I'm actually not here. Uh, you can't see me. I'm not in the shop. And, and she's like, they're there to help. They're, yeah. they're working as they're there to like celebrate yeah. your sex. And, and it's charity. super, super chilled, isn't it? Totally, like, yeah. exactly. Also, they want to be like, no, well, we're here to like yeah. help guide you on this. And I yeah. think actually for me, there's been really nice. And when you do get a bit older and you realize that they're like not judgy and then you can be like, so what is the best lube? Yeah. I am looking to really spice things up. And then you're actually, yeah, you're consulting an expert who can then give you a, you know, proper, um, some proper guidance. So yeah, great tip. Okay, so next one. So this is from Charlie. Uh, so Charlie's written in to say, do you think mutual masturbation is a good way to show a partner what works for you? Mutual Kiss. masturbation yeah. being like... I guess like masturbating next to each other. Or is it like showing them what you like? Oh, that's a good... Oh, Charlie, we don't have Charlie here. Mm. I So the way I would interpret that is, is you masturbating kind of together. So that being kind of a sexual thing. So they're like doing whatever they're doing and then we all there with your bullet. I don't know. I think totally. Yeah. I, I just think... I think it's such a personal experience, either if you, self-love, if you're doing whatever you're doing on your own or with a partner, it's whatever you both vibe off yeah. and feel is right. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. I think, you know what? For me personally, I think I, and I actually do, I've always really struggled with like touching myself or masturbating in front of someone. And there is no shame in that. If that is not something that you feel comfortable doing, that's okay. Cause I have had people kind of almost like put pressure on me to do that and be like, oh, come on, like, come on, like, you're oh, doing okay. And I've been a bit like, 
I just really don't enjoy that in the context of partner sex. And I've, I've felt embarrassed about it before. Like it's something like wrong with me. And now I'm just like, no, that's just not part of my sexual practice. And I think like showing like, so for me personally, what I find helpful rather than like masturbating with someone in front of someone, just to like guide their hand. And like, so yeah. you'll like help steer them yeah. if you're not, quite comfortable enough to go full out with yeah. your wand in front of them like yeah. that. So I think whatever, to your point, whatever makes you feel most comfortable and what yeah. makes your partner feel most comfortable, yeah. run with it. And I think that is a great way as well in like closing the orgasm gap, Sh like show them, guide their, ha guide their hands, exactly. Hands. Yeah, help, get literally just, just like, yeah, there, exactly. And it makes you feel close as well. It's totally. like really intimate. Um, totally. Yeah, love that. Okay, Danielle asks, oh, this is a good one. Do you think X-rated videos and sites can play a part in the orgasm gap as they can give a conception of what's supposed to happen without being realistic? Yes, totally. And I think we have to be careful not to ever talk about porn as kind of one monolith. Uh, obviously there's loads of different types of porn but I do think there is a lot of mainstream porn so a lot of the stuff that is available on free tube sites for example is quite problematic in my, in my view it does really uh has often put a kind of real onus on uh male pleasure I've seen a lot of violence against women and listen you know there's lots you know some people their fantasy is around violence and like fantasy is that's you know it's okay in the realm of fantasy and there's ways of showing it but I do think that I guess like the, the fact that just there's so much of this free porn available online mm. means that I think especially young people growing up who haven't been taught porn literacy, and that's a major gap in sex education, in that young kids aren't growing up with an understanding that this stuff is fantasy, it's not real, and they just have all this free content that's available online, invariably it's going to be influencing young people's perception of and relationship to sex. And as you just said there, does it, um, you know, does it uh, influence what you think sex should look like? Yes, I think invariably it does instill the idea of like, this yeah. is what sex is. And I think that's why, again, so much comes back to good edu sex education and porn literacy, because we need to be teaching kids growing up that who inevitably, they are all online, they are going to come across porn. Like, whatever you think of it, it's going to happen. So we need to be equipping people with the knowledge and understanding that this is not real. There's so many different ways of having sex and it's fundamentally about consent, about communication and about partnership. And so whatever you see online, if you, know, if you do see something online and you feel like it stimulates you, if you're gonna try and take that into the bedroom, a conversation has to happen first with your partner. Yeah. And I think that is like really, really key. So I think for me, it comes always back to education, porn literacy and good communication. And I guess it's just like opening your mind to if you've, if you've only experienced it and witnessed sex in one certain way, it's just opening your mind to the possibilities of, or not just thinking sex is X, Y, and Z. There's yeah. all these other ways. It could just be... Let's just kiss, have yeah. some hot steamy kisses love for a snogging. night. Yeah. Love snogging. Or let's just use some toys or have a little bit of, do you know what I mean? It doesn't yeah. have to be, and again, like the, the same thing over and over mm. again then as well. It's that education of, yeah. It's so key that we give people the tools that allow, uh, to allow all of us to filter between good versus bad information when it comes to sex. Oh, such a big topic. Exactly. This is a great question. Maxi B says, what are some common misconceptions or myths surrounding female orgasms and how can we debunk them? I mean, I think when I hear this, it kind of echoes a common thread that has come up throughout our conversation, that there is like one way of reaching orgasm and of having sex. And so if you can just like find that like magic thing. And as I said before, every single body is completely different. And so I think for every individual man and woman, it's so much about that like self-discovery of working out what works for you, what helps you get an orgasm. There's not just kind of one size fits all. And the problem is that historically sex research, I mean, scientific research generally has been very male centric and specifically when it comes to sex research, it has been totally focused on the male anatomy and thus female pleasure has historically been totally looked over, um, meaning that our understanding of the female anatomy and the female pleasure has been so lacking for so long and I keep on plugging her book but it really is so informative <laughs> but Dr Karen Gurney's book Mind 
the gap. And also um, Emily Nagoski, who's written the book, Come As You Are. They really are- What a name. Such a good, I know. And really, <laughs> and really informative books it. that are seeking to redress this major gap we've had in terms of sex research and really deep dive into the specificities of female pleasure um, and therefore address many of the, I don't know, they're not like mis misconceptions that have come out of complete mm. lack of knowledge and understanding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think, yeah, key amongst them when I think of both those books, I do really think about um, this idea of like that kind of one size fits all model of sex that we've been handed down, that it's penis and vagina, penetrative sex, and that's what sex is. That's the model of sex that many of us have grown up learning. And as I said, the, that doesn't work for the majority of women in terms of reaching <gasps> orgasm. The majority of women as well. Mm -mm, exactly, clitoral stimulation is yeah. so key. So I think there's, that's a roundabout way of saying there are loads of misconceptions around uh, female orgasms just because we haven't known that much yeah. about them. Right, Emma, we're gonna yes. play a game. Love a game. We're gonna give you 30 seconds yes. to name as many sex positions as possible. I feel like you have an unfair advantage here. How are you feeling about this? I don't know. <laughs> I suddenly, my mind goes blank and I'm like, fingering, that's not a position. <laughs> Should we just go straight in? Yes. And I would say, just just say words, anything that comes to right. mind, because okay. some good yes. stuff's come up. Okay, great. Okay, team, are we ready? We even have like a professional verifier over here who like Googles the positions. Okay. <laughs> what a job. Yeah. <laughs> is this a super real time <laughs> position? Yes, it is. Yeah, it is, actually. Okay, 30 seconds. Your time starts now. Oh gosh, uh, backwards cowgirl, missionary, Doggy style, uh, wheelbarrow. Um, That's a good one. I'm now a flying bird in my head. That's not a position. Probably um, is. Uh, the ju that jujitsu move where you get pinned down and all falls on. No, I don't know what that's called. Um, We're uh, gonna talk about that after. Any more animals? Something from behind cowgirl. I said backwards cowgirl. Frontwards cowgirl. She must be a front yeah. person too. Um, Time. Excellent. Seven? Seven. Seven. Woo! My lucky number. Mm. Who's on the top spot at the moment? Who's winning? What have we got? Izzy and Gemma. How what, many? What have they got? Ten. Oh, God. Yeah, it. Izzy and Gemma got 10, but you know, they were working together. Oh, so. oh my gosh. If we'd done that together, we could have got. I love how seriously this is being taken. <laughs> like everyone's like, what's the score? Yeah. Was it seven? Oh, but I think it might be six. Might what's be the jiu jitsu? I think it's seven. I think I I heard seven loud and clear, and I, I think that's know. the number. That... What's the ju 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 jitsu? I have no idea what this move is, but I literally just was sleeping with a sex addict who did ju jitsu, and he used to just do this ju jitsu. And he'd like pin me like his legs. Right, it was just it was. Was it good? Yeah, it kind of gave me the ick because he gave me the ick, but it like there was something. Was it like very acrobatic? Yeah, it made him like kind of hunch up. It wasn't cool actually, but it was all right. I wouldn't. <laughs> yeah, I've got enough to Google. It, it was, <laughs> I don't know if it's like a legit movie. He just like, took it out of his jujitsu. He was a very like intense wow. jujitsu. I actually do think jujitsu is a good practice for sex. But... You had it here. Exactly, heard it here first. <laughs> Emma, thank you so much. This has been the most incredible conversation. Oh, Everyone behind the cameras here has all been like, <gasps> listening. Have you enjoyed it? I've absolutely <laughs> loved it. Thank you so much. And I really, really appreciate you having me on this because I think this is such an important topic to discuss. And I think having more of these open, honest conversations and I think can make such a difference to people's sex lives and totally their lives agree. more broadly. So thank you for having me. Totally agree. I'm going to get on the phone to my girls now. Yes, exactly. Like, right, exactly. We are talking you about this. Your homework. Tell five people about the orgasm gap and get them to tell five people and then see how quickly it's better. Yeah, so you've got to tell five, five people, people about the orgasm gap. Yes, five. And see what happens. Exactly. But yeah, thank you so much for watching. This has been amazing. Thank you for having me. Lots Bye. of love.